It's so easy for us at times to see things wrongly. Churches are guilty of this as much as Israel to minimize or maybe even miss what God has done for us because we're trying to interpret present blessings in, through the lens of past blessings. Quite honestly, our church could be, could be very tempted to fall into this. Perhaps you are. Some of you were here when on a Sunday morning, all of these were, or a lot of these pews were full. And, you know, things happened and so forth. And, um, you know, we won't go into all that. And not that I know all that because I wasn't here. But things got pretty down, didn't they? But in the last, I, and I give God the glory, but I believe in the last five years, he's done a lot of wonderful things. He's turned this church around in many ways. He's revitalized us spiritually. We haven't filled all the pews. We could be very easily discouraged if we were trying to interpret present blessings through the lens of old blessings. Now, Psalm 147 is in the context of what we call the uh, return of the exiles. If you remember the nation of Israel after Solomon broke into two sections. You had the southern kingdom, which became known as Judah or Judea. Uh, and then you had the northern section, which became known as Israel. The northern section, when, it, when that split happened, never followed God again. They went completely into idolatry. They did not have one king that served God. But God did send them prophets up into the northern section to preach the word to them, but with very minimal success. The southern kingdom had, I think, eight good kings after that, uh, or in all total, and um, they did have some revivals and so forth, but the revivals tended to be very short-lived. Uh, some were more thorough than others. But over time, God, of course, then began to condemn both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And he said he was going to destroy the northern kingdom, and he was going to send the southern kingdom into exile. Well, the Assyrians came in and destroyed the, the northern kingdom, like God said, and uh, they left some of the people. But they, one of the things that the Assyrians had a tendency to do was uh, when they conquered a group, they would take transplants from one conquered area and populate this conquered area, and then they would take a large population of that newly conquered area and move them somewhere else. And the reason they would do that, that would destabilize uh, that, that nation, and the nation would virtually be uh, incapable of resistance after that. So that's what happened to the northern kingdom. And, um, but the southern kingdom uh, was not conquered by the Assyrians. There's a wonderful, incredible deliverance that God did on behalf of the southern kingdom when Hezekiah was king. But later, the Babylonians did come in, and they uh, destroyed Jerusalem and took most uh, uh, or a lot uh, whom they didn't kill they took with them to back to Babylon as slaves. And we know some of those, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we read about in the book of Daniel. Ezekiel the prophet was one of them. Jeremiah lived during that time, but he did not, he was not um, um, captured by the Babylonians. He fled into Egypt and eventually died there. So that's where, uh, where that exile begins, in Babylon. Seventy years go by, a lot of empire transition goes on. The Medes and the Persians and, and Babylon falls and all these kinds of things. But eventually, a group is allowed to come back 
to the city to rebuild the wall and eventually also rebuild a much smaller temple. And that happened during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. This is where Psalm 147 picks up. It is in reference to those people who are coming out of this exile and they are coming to the ruins of Jerusalem. If you want to read more about it, Nehemiah, uh, Ezra. But when Nehemiah comes, shows up on the scene, he's, he goes around and inspects the wall. That was his job. Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the wall. In ancient times, a city could not survive without a wall. And so Nehemiah wanted that wall up. So he surveyed that. The wall was completely destroyed, but they rebuilt it. During Ezra's time, they rebuilt not all, but a good bit of the temple. And then later it was finished and or virtually finished. It was a work in progress for hundreds of years, quite honestly. But that's where we are in Psalm 147. And the reason I give you that background is so that in your heart and mind, you can put yourself maybe a little bit into what it would have been like to have been a follower of Jehovah, Yahweh, the true and the living God, the God of Israel. You've never seen, maybe you've never even seen Jerusalem. It's been 70 years. Maybe you grew up in Babylon or, you know, or wherever in the Medo-Persian Empire. You've heard about Jerusalem. You've heard about the old times. You've heard about David and, and the kings of Israel. And, and, and you've read about them in Scripture, but you've never been there. So these people are coming back after 70 years of exile, wanting to reestablish the, the covenant relationship with God that they had and the nation that God raised up. So that's what's going on. I've entitled this God's special care for his chosen people. God's special care for his chosen people. And what you see in this passage uh, in Psalm 147 is the writer is giving us or giving Israel uh, reasons why they should praise the Lord. Uh, if you study this exile return period uh, through the minor prophets and, and so forth, you, you begin to find out that there was a little bit of excitement to come back to the land and to rebuild the walls. But by and large, it was not something that the people were incredibly excited about. Nehemiah was facing opposition both inside the city and outside the city. Nehemiah was constantly having trouble with the ex exiles who had come to repopulate the city. They didn't, they didn't want to do things right. They didn't want to obey God the right way. And Ezra had the same problem. And there was a point when the foundation of the temple was, going, was laid that the people looked at the foundation of the temple and it wasn't anywhere near as large as Solomon's temple. And they could already see in this foundation that this temple was not going to be as grandiose and glorious as the original. And so you know what they did? They just stopped building it. They, they got discouraged. And they just, they, they just looked at and they thought, well, this temple's not going to be anything like. The wall is not as beautiful as it used to be. This is just so hard. Uh, I just, you know, and they just stopped. They would not serve God in this way. And this is why Ezra, Nehemiah, and many of the, or several of the minor prophets are having messages to the people telling them to stop behaving this way, but to embrace what God has done for them. What nation has been conquered and its people taken away? And then after 70 years, it's 
its captors fund the repopulation and the rebuilding of your capital city. That's a miracle. Nehemiah was sent by the king to rebuild the wall and given the money to do it. This was a movement of God. And isn't that the way it is sometimes with us when the difficult times come, when things seem like they're going to be, they're, they're falling down around us? Uh, they're not what we wanted them to be. They're not what we thought they might be. It's so easy to then become ungrateful, to minimize or maybe even miss what God has done for us because we're trying to interpret present blessings through the lens of past blessings. Churches are guilty of this as much as Israel. Quite honestly, our church could be, could be very tempted to fall into this. Perhaps you are. Some of you were here when, on a Sunday morning, all these were, or a lot of these pews were full. And, you know, things happened and so forth. And, um, you know, we won't go into all that. And not that I know all that because I wasn't here. But things got pretty down, didn't they? But in the last, I may not give God the glory, but I believe in the last five years he's done a lot of wonderful things. He's turned this church around in many ways. He's revitalized us spiritually. We haven't filled all the pews. We could be very easily discouraged if we were trying to interpret present blessings through the lens of old blessings. That's what these folks were doing. And so the psalmist is trying to encourage them to see the blessings of God and to give God praise and thanksgiving and to sing to him because of what he's done. So we see in the first verse, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Why would you have to convince somebody that praising God is pleasant or fitting? You see, that's the context, isn't it? These folks are having to be reconvinced that God is worthy of their praise, that He is worthy of their songs, of their thanksgiving. He gives reasons for praise. Israel should praise the Lord because, uh, the, in verses 2 through 11, because God builds up Israel. Now, technically, we could say it this way. God, God builds up Jerusalem which will eventually become the southern kingdom again, Judea, okay? It was Judah before the, um, they were conquered by the Babylonians. After the exile, they will eventually become known as Judea. And you'll read that in the, in the New Testament. But this psalm, Psalm 147, is particularly referring to Jerusalem. I just put Israel here because they are the chosen people of God. But this, the poetic word here you, used by the psalmist is Jerusalem. And it's primarily saying, what is God doing? He's saying to them, you are returning from the exile. God is rebuilding or building up Jerusalem. Jerusalem is no longer a pile of rubble. It's no longer the place where vagabonds and, and travelers hide out. It's becoming a city again. It's, re, it's coming back together. And he begins to unpack what this means, that he builds up Jerusalem. He, verse 4, some, well, we see some examples that that. God knows each one. He says, He determines the number of the stars. 
He gives to all of them their names. Uh, look in verse 2. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, which is where I got that. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. There it is. He's bringing the people back to Judah. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Some scholars have even said that this could be referring to the wounds of being in bondage. Essentially, or many of them were slaves. Now, over the time of exile, 70 years, some Jews uh, began to prosper financially. They didn't want to come back to the city of Jerusalem. They had, made, they had opened businesses and, and moved up in the ranks in, in the pagan empire. So they were like, you guys go ahead. You know, and I'm sure they probably helped fund, fund it and so forth. But many of them stayed where they were. But thousands of them did come back to the city of Jerusalem. And, and the psalmist, he says first that, he, that God knows each one. Now, verse 4 in verse 4, he's, he determines the number of the stars. There is two ways of interpreting this verse. Uh, one is, interprets it like God is, that this is praising God as the creator. I do believe that, that he does that, but I believe he does that later. I don't believe that's what's happening here. Now, some, some commentators and scholars will say God knows the numbers of the stars. And God, cre but why? Because God created the stars. And God has, has a name for each star. Well, that's probably true. But in my opinion, that's not what this psalm is saying. And the reason is the context. If you look, the context is referring to the people of Israel. He says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Who are the stars? Well, I believe it's his covenant people. You say, well, why, what's, the, what's the point of that? He knows each one by name. See, this is what I think the psalmist is saying. Praise God. Give him glory. You are no less loved by God than the original people that God brought out of Egypt and founded this nation. He has made all these stars, you, and he knows you by name because they felt less, less than maybe the glorious history of Israel. These people had been slaves. They had been in exile. So he knows each one, verse 4. He heals each one, verses 2 and 3. He heals the brokenhearted. You know, it's been a long time since Americans have ever been under any kind of bondage. But if you read American history, then you, you, you would see where early Americans uh, were very much under bondage. Even in Parliament, there were uh, men arguing uh, for Americans. They were saying, these are British citizens. These are Englishmen. Why are we treating them this way? Our founding fathers in America had every reason to, to have a revolution. It wasn't the revolutionary kind of thinking that's going on today, which is nothing but Marxism. No, the American Revolution, it's a genuine revolution. They, the American Revolution is, is going back to civil government. That was what our fathers, founding fathers in America, wanted to do. And, of course, then there was the freedom of the slaves who were under bondage um, in the 19th century. So God can heal 
the brokenhearted. I think we need to remember that. There is no group on the planet that hasn't been persecuted or even enslaved. If you study the word slave, it means slav. Why? Because the uh, Europeans would enslave the Slavs. They were poor people. By the way, they were white. So it was white people um, enslaving other white people. St. Patrick, that we think of, was captured and taken to Ireland as a slave. So here was white people enslaving other white people. That's gone on all around the world throughout history. And I'm not minimizing it. I'm saying that the brokenhearted, those who have been harmed, God can bind up their wounds if we let them. God wants to heal them. He wants to build up Israel. He wants to heal their broken hearts. He wants to forgive them of their sins. God lifts each one. Look in verse 5 and 6. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. The psalmist is appealing to them. Do you not see that God is lifting you up? It might be easy to say, oh yeah, we're free from slavery now and we're free to rebuild these walls which are now in rubble. We have to rebuild the gates. We have to rebuild the temple. We have to rebuild the city. We have to rebuild everything. And the psalmist is saying, do you not see? God has lifted you up and he's cast down the proud. Where is the nation, can I just say this, where is the nation that conquered the southern kingdom? Babylon at this time. Can anybody tell me? Hmm? Mm. No. Babylon was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. So the writing on the wall. Yeah, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. That was, that was the condemnation of Babylon. And God destroyed them. The, the Medes and the Persians united and went in and destroyed this mighty empire. This, this empire, if I remember correctly, the wall was so thick that two chariots could ride around the wall side by side. It was impregnable, they thought. Putting things in context. Where's the proud? They're gone. Where's God's people? They're entering into a new era in the land of promise. It's so easy for us at times to see things wrongly. I went to a church years ago that had gone through difficult times, uh, probably worse than Coggins ever did. Uh, they had several splits and so forth before I got there. I can remember praying and pleading for the Lord, with the Lord, for that congregation because I felt like those people had been mistreated and uh, they were left holding the bag, as it was, as it were. They had this massive campus, um, and, and, you know, they were less than 100 people. And I was praying, and I kept praying, you know, that, and, but in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, you know, why, why have these people been so pressed down by the ones that, that had done everything and left? And then one day, and not that I heard any voices or any of that, but it's as if the Lord just gave me a new perspective. I stood up from prayer one day, and it suddenly, I saw everything differently. And again, I'm not saying God spoke to me in that way. He speaks through his word. But in my heart and in my mind, it was as if I thought the Lord revealed to me that 
he had blessed these people. That I was looking at this completely wrong. They hadn't been left holding the bag. They had been given everything. They had a whole campus. They had all the money that the church had acquired over the years. They had the truth, the gospel. They had everything standing in front of them. They were beginning to grow again. And, and God had done just like this. God had given them everything, but I saw it the wrong way. They could have sold the property and gone and built another building that was manageable. Or they could stay where they were. They could switch buildings with another church. They had plenty of money in the bank. They had all kinds of... God had actually blessed them. It was me and probably them who were looking at the situation through these glasses of complaining or doubt or not seeing the plan of God the right way. He lifts each one up. He provides for all. Look in verse 7 through 11. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre, which is a stringed instrument. A, stringed instrument. a lyre in many ways is very, very close to a guitar. Am I right about that, Pete? It's not a guitar, but it's similar. Yeah. Hmm? My says harp. harp, kind of one of the small, it's not a big harp, you know, the, you know, it's the little one you hold in your hand, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, which there's all kinds of those. Um, so great is the Lord. Uh, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He, here's the, where he begins to praise God as the creator, as I said. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. He delights in, his delight is not in the strength of the horse nor in his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. What's the point of this creation praise? Well, it's right here in verse, um, verse 10. He's building this up. The Lord covers the earth. He provides food for the animals and all these things. And then verse 10, his delight is not in the strength of the horse or the legs of man, but God takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. God provides for you. You're looking at things through the world's view. You're looking at the strength of the horse or the legs of men. But God's not looking for man's help. God doesn't need a hand up. God doesn't need our help to rebuild Jerusalem. God doesn't need our help to build his church. Jesus said, I shall build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What he wants is for us to fear him, verse, verse 11. He takes pleasure. Can I say it this way? He takes pleasure in blessing those who fear him. Those who, and how do we fear God? Here it is. Those who hope in his covenant love, in his loving kindness. Remember I've said before, when you see the word loving kindness, that that typically at least carries a connotation of God's covenant Or God's, let me, let me say it this way, God's love for his people expressed, sorry for my writing, through giving them a covenant. In other words, how do I know God loves me? 
because God made a covenant with me. And so also his church might say, how do I know that God loves us? How does the church know that God loves us? And in the same thing, the Lord Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. This is the new covenant in my blood. This old covenant was ratified by blood. Moses slayed, you know, the lamb. He took the hyssop plant, dipped it in the blood, and sprinkled the blood over the people. That was the blood of the covenant. And Jesus, in a similar fashion, referring and hearkening back to that covenant, Old Testament covenant, says, this blood, this wine is my blood. Drink all of it. It's the blood of the new covenant. And do it in remembrance of me. That is the remembrance of the love of God. We have a covenant with the living God. God's special care for his chosen people. Yes, we're in a fallen world. Yes, he chastises his people. But he also blesses them. He also binds their wounds. He also heals their broken hearts. He also brings them home, you see, like a loving father. He strengthens Israel. He strengthens. Don't worry, I won't spend this much time on the other ones. <laughs> he strengthens Israel. We see in verses 12 through 14, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Jerusalem, the hill of Jerusalem was called the Zion, the hill of Zion, or the Mount Zion. So that's why the Jerusalem and Zion and Israel are a lot of times used interchangeably. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. What's he saying? He's saying, rejoice and praise God. God has rebuilt your walls, Jerusalem. He has put, put bars back on your gates. He has blessed your children to fill the streets again. And he's given you the best of the food. Can we say it a, another way? Stop whining and complaining and belly aching, looking back and see the blessings that God has poured out on you right now. Right now, God is pouring out blessings to his people. He protects against enemies in verse 13. He prepares the next generation, verse 13. He, he grants peace to their borders in verse 14 and provides more than they need in the second part of verse 14. And then we have, he speaks. He speaks to Israel. He speaks to Israel. Verses 15 through 20. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? Can you stand in a blizzard, a whiteout? No. No. But God sends out his word and melts it all. You and I, the legs of man or the strength of horses, cannot withstand a blizzard. We will freeze to death. We'll die. But Almighty God can say, stop. And the blizzard will stop and the snow will melt and it'll be a beautiful day again. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, Remember what Jesus did? The storm raging, the disciples, some of whom were, were professional fishermen, were panicked. Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? And Jesus stood up and said, peace. Or literally, be quiet. That's literally what it means. 
Be quiet. The Creator just told His creation, Hush! And it just stopped. And they said, What manner of man is this? Well, the answer to that is, He's God. He's the Almighty God. And that's the point here. He's saying to the Israelites, stop trusting in horses. Stop trusting in the power of man. Stop praising these things. God, stop looking for this kingdom or that kingdom or Egypt or Babylon or the Medes or the Persians or somebody to come around and fund you and make you a prosperous land again. God doesn't need them. He has his word. And he will build his kingdom by his word. He'll do all of this. The Word of God is referred to in these, these verses from 15 through 26 times. Beginning in verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth. His Word runs swiftly. When God says it, now we may have to wait on the Lord. But when God decides it's time, heaven and earth cannot stand in his way. God opens a door and no man can close it. He sends out his word. His word runs swiftly. Verse uh, 18, he sends out his word and it melts them. Verse 19, he declares his word to who? Jacob. His statutes, that's another word for his word, and his rules to Israel. There's number five. In verse 20, he has not dealt up thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Number six, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In other words, he says this, there is no other nation on planet earth that God Almighty has met with personally. And spoken to them. All the other gods of the people are false gods. God is real. The creator of heaven and earth met with Israel and made a covenant with them. And the psalmist is saying, Do you understand what you have? You might be small, but Israel's always been small. You have the word of God. God has not dealt thus with any other nation. And can we say this? There is no place on this earth where the word of God goes forth than in the true churches of God around the world. This is the place of truth. This is what Paul means when he says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth that we declare the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We are just like that. We have the covenant of God. Why will the gates of hell not prevail against the church? Because we have the word of God. Not because we're anything. Not because we could fight off the devil or any of that. But because we, our trust is in the word of the Lord. And God secures us in that. And so I hope that the Lord will encourage you as he did his people so long ago. No one can resist the power of God's word in verses 15 through 18. When God desires to save a soul, he's going to save a soul. When God desires to raise a church, he's going to raise a church. Men may try to put it down, but they can't. Not if God raises it up. That's what Gamaliel said in the book of Acts. No one but Israel has God's word. And Paul told us that in, in the first three chapters of Romans where he said the word of God was not given to the pagans because they had gone after sins and their own idols and they had buried the truth of God and become darkened. But God did give his word to Israel and the covenants and the promises. But what did Israel do? They cast them aside and sinned. And so now Paul says the gospel goes to the world. 
And God is not just gathering a people out of the Medo-Persian Empire to come back to the city of Jerusalem. But God is sending his people into the world to preach the gospel, whereby he will gather a people for his name from every tribe and kindred and tongue around the earth from the world. That is the church. God has not forgiven, forgotten us. He has not, he has forgiven us, but he hasn't forgotten us. He will and does. God's blessing the church today. Sometimes I think we, we pray for revival, and I get that, and, I, and I, I'm not discouraging that in any way. But sometimes you wonder, don't you, if the Lord maybe looks back at us or, or, and says, why don't you enjoy what I'm doing now? Instead of just sitting around waiting on revival, how about preach, live, glorify, worship, send missionaries, let God worry about revival. That's his work anyway. Our work is to be faithful, to fear the Lord, to love the Lord, and to follow the Lord. Let's pray. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.